Sebastian is a jittery, jiving crustacean, tasked with the impossible job of keeping an eye on the Princess Ariel. His voice is imbued with anxiety, pride, and music, all rolled into one crab. But who gave this crab such a fantastic performance? Let's find out. Samuel E. Wright was born on November 20th, 1946, a proud native of Camden, South Carolina. He describes himself as an odd child who was continually creating stories and acting them out. Even more strange, Disney had a significant influence on him as a child. I always wanted to work for Disney. Ever since I was a little kid, I've always wanted to. I used to paint uh, Disney characters on, on, on window pane glass and mail it to Disney. I'm sure they, why is the kid sending us broken glass <laughs> with paint all over it? But I always wanted to work for Disney, and I got my chance. It was like a dream come true. It really was. Samuel continued to act through high school and in college, where he was among the first students to participate in Carolina State University's theater program. One year, the troupe was invited to the Yale Drama Festival, where he got scouted by CW Post Long Island University. They offered him a full scholarship. <laughs> But he wasn't very interested in going. His roommate at the time changed all that. I was doing theater at the time at uh, South Carolina State College, and my roommate, Nell Brooks, I would talk about every night being an actor or something. You know how guys talk in the dorm. And he said to me, he just turned over one night, and he said, you, you, you're not going to do anything. You are chicken. You're not going to go out there and you're not going to ever try this. And so I said, all right, let me get packed. Take me to the bus station tonight. I'm going. Thinking that he was going to say, no, 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 don't do that. Because we're in Orangeburg. Then he turned to me and he said, OK, get in the car. <laughs> so I got in the car and we drove to the bus station, me expecting him to just get up and leave and go back. And then, of course, I would come back to campus. And, ha, ha, ha. Well, no, he stayed there until the bus came. Got on the bus thinking, wow, when I get to the next stop, I'll do the same process. I'll take the bus back, go back to school. Ha, ha, ha. I fell asleep. And I ended up in New York City, broke, totally penniless, no place to stay, with one little dream extra that I could harvest. At first, he stayed at CW Post College and helped set up their theater department. However, being so close to New York made him realize that his dream was just miles away. So, one day, he packed up all his stuff and hitched hike to Broadway, where he remained homeless until he got his break. In return for living in a theater, he was hired as a stage tech painting the stage after every performance. He was also cast as a role nobody else wanted to play. Javier from Les Miserables. I'm just kidding, it was a nude statue. So I had to, to come on stage and stand immobile and pretend to be this nude statue. But again, like I say, my acting and my hubris wouldn't let me just get away with standing there. So I lit myself very surreptitiously and covered myself in I think it was mineral oil every night, so I'd look plastic. And I would stand there for the whole length of the play. And if somebody bumped me, I'd rock. <laughs> Stupid little acting stuff, but this is what you do. When the show got reviewed, Clive Barnes, who was the big uh, reviewer for the New York Times at that time, hated the play, trashed the entire play, and then added as an addendum to the end of the interview. But I was impressed with a young Afro man named Sam Wright who played the nude statue, who stood impressively immobile for two and a half hours. <laughs> and that was it. So I, I was on my way, I thought. He continued to audition, and his homeless friends helped him stay clean to succeed. Um, the homeless people in New York City were the ones who brought me up in that situation, they would keep my clothes clean. They would panhandle so that I could get enough money to take the subway uptown and back. And that's what I did. One day, 
He auditioned for Jesus Christ Superstar. I wasn't a union actor, so I was in this long line of non-union actors called an open call. That's when they let everybody come. So I was in that, went in, I got looked out first. I was too tall and I would stand out in the crowd. So they said, no, 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 thank you, and off I went. Most people would have forgotten about it. Again, that Camden boy took over, and I said, I'm going back. So I went back. They threw me out. I kept going back. They kept throwing me out. Eventually, to the open call that was standing out there, it was becoming entertainment. He's coming. There he is. He's going in. I started dressing in costumes. I once went in in a robe dressed as Jesus with spaghetti doing the stigmata. They threw me out. They threw me out 18 times. And the 19th time I came in, the show was taken over by a guy named Tom O'Horgan, who directed Hair on Broadway. And uh, I was on stage, and they yelled from the auditorium, that's him, get him. And everybody would run up to try to snatch me and throw me out the door. But as they're dragging me off, and I'm going, please, please, let me. So he said, who is that? That's what he told me later. And somebody said, that's the guy, the bum. You know, he lives on the streets. He, he just comes here and he auditions and bothers everybody. And he said, well, let's see what he sounds like. So he brought me in and stuck me in center stage like I am now. And um, he said, um, all right, Mr. Wright, sing us a song. And I went, well, you see, that's the problem. And he said, why? I said, because I don't really have a song because nobody ever let me sing. And I have no money for sheet music, so he said, can you sing anything? I said, well, I know Happy Birthday. And this was pre-Stevie Wonder, Happy Birthday. So I stood up there and I sung Happy Birthday, and they said very cordially, thank you. And I, I forgot about it up until then. I was walking down the street and going to Hebrew National. You know all of these places I'm talking about. Going to Hebrew National to pick up a sandwich, one of those big, thick ham sandwiches that I ate all day long. And coming back, there was a fellow who walked up to me, and he said, are you Sam Wright? Are you that guy? And I said, one guy, because maybe I owed him money. So I said, what guy? He said, the guy that used to come in and do all those auditions and stuff. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, Tom O'Horgan wants to see you tomorrow morning. I'm like, why? He said, he wants you to audition. So I showed up the next day. I auditioned for Superstar. And I got it. He was initially cast as part of the chorus, but through hard work and volunteering, he landed some understudy roles. Then, right before opening night, he got his big break. And one of the actors who was doing one of the lead roles, Simon Zelotes, um, uh, was at odds with the producer, and they packed him up and sent him back to L.A. There was no Simon. It was opening night. So the next thing I hear over the speaker system is all the uh, men in the company report to the basement. There we were, in the basement, and we all auditioned for the role of Simon. I got it. And I went on opening night as Simon. And from that particular point on, I played every character from other characters, from Judas to just about anything they needed. Uh, one eventful night, Yvonne Elliman, who was doing Mary, lost her voice. So I had to sing, I don't know how to. I had to go through that in a microphone while she lips it. So that elevated it a little bit. From there, his career skyrocketed. In 1972, he was cast as a replacement for Valentine in Two Gentlemen of Verona. In 1974, he was cast as a replacement for Sam in Over Here. He also appeared as a leading player in Pippin. And at some point in 1983, he was cast as the starring role in Tap Dance Kid, for which he received a Tony nomination. And luckily for him, never Javier in Les Miserables. Shortly after, Sam got a call from his agent. Little did he know that this would change his entire career. I ended up in this tiny little room with these two guys who looked like they had been up for six weeks with beards and 
They looked horrible. It was Howard Ashman and Alan Minkin. I didn't know at the time, and they didn't know they were Howard Ashman and Alan Minkin. So I was supposed to do this audition and sing this song called Under the Sea. Now, originally, Sebastian was supposed to be a turtle. But I didn't, I saw, I heard this wonderful calypso music that Howard wrote, and I thought, this could be a little bit jauntier. So to Howard's glee and to Alan's, Mm, I don't know. I said to him, could we speed up the tempo? So I sung the song, and I ended up on top of the table singing the song very enthusiastically again, and um, finished it, bump, and I heard the obligatory, yes, well, we'll call you, don't call us. End of it, I thought, okay? No more 18 auditions, I'm moving on. Er, I got a call from my agent when I got home, and he said, well, you got it. I said, got what? He said, do you remember you auditioned for the Calypso thing, Sammy Davis Jr.? And I said, yeah. He said, well, Disney wants you to do it. And I went, do what? And he said, this little crab that they developed. And I went, wait, no, 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 no. I'm an actor. I'm not doing any animated crab right now. I'm in the middle of my career. I can't disappear behind the facade. He said, Sam, you're broke. Okay. So I go out and I start doing The Little Mermaid. I couldn't do a Jamaican accent. Mm -hmm. I didn't really? know how to do, No, I couldn't do a Jamaican accent. I could do a Trinidadian accent. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people don't know that there's a difference, but right. those of you who do know <laughs> that there's a difference. Got it. Um, and I started doing this accent and uh, he, Howard said, stop, 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 what are you doing, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do a Jamaican accent. He said, no, 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 that's the accent I want. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, because mm -hmm. he had spent time, apparently, in his life on the island. Got it. And, and that's the, the sound he wanted. It's a little softer than, than Jamaican. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not as hard as, as, as a Jamaican accent. Right. My most favorite moment was when after years of filming it and, and being very strict to animation because you have to be strict with animation because it's timing and picture and, and, and that kind of thing. And I was really strict with it. And, but I kept doing things. I'd be naughty and I'd do something. And they'd say, Sam, you can't do that. This is not Robin Williams. You cannot do that. You can't make up little jokes on the side. So I, okay. About a year after we finished completing the film, they called me up and they said, Sam, we're gonna fly you out here, okay? I said, why? I thought we were finished. They said, all of those things we told you you couldn't do in the beginning, you got three hours to do all of them. So they brought me in the studio and they just turned the mic on and I went nuts. I just said anything I wanted to say like Sebastian, I talked like him for three hours and some of it found its way into the movie. For example, teenagers, they think they know everything. Give them an inch, they swim all over you. <laughs> that was something I just made up. So, I, you know what I mean? So that, it was a lot of fun. After The Little Mermaid, Samuel played Sebastian in every appearance of his character, from video games to TV shows to sequels. He also continued to act on stage. In 1989, Samuel played Bruce Aiken in Welcome to the Club with fellow Little Mermaid actress Jody Benson. In 1991, he played Major Joe Clark in Mulebone, and in 1997, he auditioned for another Disney first, The Lion King on Broadway. So I go in there, and of course, the Disney producers see me, and they go immediately into a caucus, because this guy is Sebastian. He can't do this noble character. <laughs> He's a crab. And the, the director, who was Julie Taymor, thank God again, said, ah, give him a chance, see what he does. So I did the audition, and to my surprise, I got the job. So now I'm doing The Lion King, Minneapolis, we come to New York, we all think it's going to be a flop because it's a Disney movie. And Disney movies hadn't taken over Broadway as of yet. We opened in a refurbished theater that was on 8th Avenue, which used to be an old, you know, back in the day. So we opened there, did the show, got pretty good reviews. Surprise again. Then, I got nominated for a Tony. Night. I 
Samuel also played the villain in a very obscure Disney film, Dinosaur. Our survival, our future, is over these rocks. Now let's go home! You'll make it, won't you boys? No! Watch them, they're tough. If they can do it, so can you! Samuel cites this movie as one of the most emotional for him. It brings together what I really believe, that we're all connected on this planet, even the dinosaurs to us. And by doing the film, I actually broke down in tears and when we were recording it, when all of them, um, excuse me, lose their lives to the meteor. And um, one of the little monkeys says, they're all gone. I thought, that's horrible. We lost peep, things that were akin to us in one fell swoop, and they left us, God bless them, the planet. Samuel is currently in retirement, working on promoting the arts all over the U.S. In 1994, he and his wife, Amanda Wright, opened Hudson Valley Conservatory, where children and adults can all come together to perform. Samuel E. Wright has an exciting life with very entertaining stories to go with it. As we can see with these interviews, he is a fantastic storyteller, a testament to his many accomplishments throughout his career. His work as Sebastian also demands recognition for his energetic and nervous performance. Let's hope he continues to promote the arts, and who knows, maybe we'll see him again at Disney someday. And hopefully never as Javier from Les Miserables. Thank you for watching this episode of Dizographies. Click the thumbs up button below if you liked it, and if you want to be notified when the next episode comes out, consider subscribing. Comment below with characters you would like to see us cover. Further reading and references are linked in the description. We hope to see you in another Dizography.